I am honored to be joined with His Excellency Bishop Athanasius Schneider. He's the Auxiliary Bishop of St. Mary and Astana in Kazakhstan. And he has spoken and written extensively about reverence for the Most Holy Eucharist, the Blessed Sacrament. And he recently has started an initiative to begin reparations to the Sacred Heart for abuses made against the Holy Eucharist, and especially during this COVID situation in which people are doing novel things with the Eucharist and bringing even more desecration. So thank you so much for joining me today, Your Excellency. Mm -hmm. May we begin with... In the beginning, in nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater noster qui es in celis, sanctificetum nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in celo et in terra. Panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis hodie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris. Et ne nos in ducas in tentationem, sed libera nos a malo. Amen. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Your Excellency. You're welcome. So before we, we talk about your initiative and your plan and your prayer, uh, there was a recent study in which uh, they took unconsecrated hosts and they put black gloves on and they went through what would be 10 communions in the hand, and they were able to collect 108 particles of these unconsecrated hosts, which reveals that in a mass in which there could be hundreds of communion in the hand, potentially there could be thousands of lost particles of our Lord Jesus Christ that fall to the floor, that get on people's clothing. This seems to be a grave desecration, and yet the church seems to allow it since the, uh, I guess, around 1969 when the Novus Ordo came in. Can you, as a bishop, can you speak to this and what we should be doing? Yes, I think this is one of the grievous um, uh, phenomena in the crisis of the church, inside the crisis. It's for me the deepest and the most dangerous because. It is the Lord with the communion in hand. We are directly uh, outreaching, desecrating the holiest of holies, our Lord. And everyone uh, can see that um, during communion in hand, uh, little particles are lost and fall down on the floor. It is evident. It's a common experience of every priest that in the end of the Mass, on the pattern, there are some particles or every, always of the host. And even in our country, thanks be to God, we have only communion, kneeling and on the tongue by a general decree of the Bishop's Conference. And we use the pattern uh, um, for the distribution of Holy Communion. And it's very often that I see some little particles after distributing Holy Communion. So, no one can deny, but in every little particle, it's the entire Christ. This is our faith. And so, by this practice, it is practically denying the dogma uh, of the Church that in every little particle is the entire Christ. And Unfortunately, it was allowed by Paul VI in 69 um, to some, uh, to contrary to the opinion and the advice of the majority of the episcopate in the entire world. Because in 68, Paul VI consulted all the bishops and asked them if uh, they consider uh, uh, good to introduce the new practice of communion in hand. And the majority rejected this. And so many bishops answered the Pope exactly with this argument that a lot of particles will be lost, will be. This is a fact. And the other argument was 
that by this practice, by time, uh, the people will lose the faith, the fullness of faith in the Eucharist. And, the, and then the devotion and the uh, sacredness will diminish. So this, what, these were the three main arguments. But unfortunately, the Pope Paul VI allowed this, and in, he, in the document which the congregation wrote in his name, the die document, Memoriale Dominum, Domini, uh, says it is good to keep the tradition of the church, uh, the communion uh, on the tongue, but with one phrase in the, in the end of the document, but in some cases, when the bishops want the bishops' conferences, they can, in, they can introduce this. So, with one phrase, they contradict it in practice, not in theory, the entire document, and opened the gates of a flood, which everyone could foresee. And now we have the, the consequences, and we have arrived at the top the hate of all these uh, desecrations in our time. In the United States, the polls have shown that over half of Catholics do not believe in transubstantiation. They do not believe that the consecrated host is the true body of Christ, that, that the wine transubstantiates into the blood. It seems that this is a consequence of decades of people coming forward, seeing Eucharistic abuse, receiving in the hand, perhaps seeing these particles, it seems to be a natural conclusion that if this is common food, just like the food we eat at home, then there's nothing supernatural about it. Do you think this lack of faith in the Eucharist is universal in the church, or is this just an American problem? I, don't, I think it's not universal because I know other countries at least in our country, thanks be to God, all the Catholics believe firmly. But because of the, the, also the right that they are kneeling and um, receiving on the tongue, and also the European Catholic countries, that is still kept by the faithful, uh, the true faith in the Eucharist, the transubstantiation and the real presence maybe also in Africa and some Asian countries. But it's common in those countries in the Western world, like Western Europe, and now ever more even South Europe, America, the Americas, that by the practice of the communion in hand for decades, by time, uh, the, implicitly, the, the, the fullness of faith in the transubstantiation uh, diminished and, and even disap disappeared. So it is a contradiction. The Lex Orandi is contradicted by the Lex, uh, you know, I think the Lex Credendi, the law of faith, is contradicted by the law of the right, the, the, the prayer. And we have to return to the fullness also of the exterior expressions, which is a profession, a confession of the faith, the rights, even in the details, it is, uh, as demand our nature, human nature, and as God also established in Holy Scripture, in the Old Testament, uh, the detailed worship to His Majesty. And the same we have in the New Testament, when you read the Apocalypse, the Revelation of John, then you see the heavenly uh, liturgy also with the, the, detail, the details there of reverence and sacredness. So we have to uh, ask God uh, that uh, the communion in hand may, should soonly, hopefully, uh, in a not so distant future, uh, finish. And, and even be prohibited by the church again, as it was prohibited by the church in the ninth century or 
uh, with the first prohibition they had, even with the threat of the excommunication, who will receive communion in hand, this was uh, a synod in France in the ninth century, will be excommunicated. So the church was very uh, aware uh, that the communion in hand, they had a bad experience in the centuries before the ninth century already, and therefore the church made this decision. And so I hope that also by this crusade of reparation to our Eucharistic Lord, that we that God may give his church again pastors and popes who will defend, who will be the first defenders of the holiness and the sacredness of our Lord in the Holy Host. Yes, I'm, recently I was I was doing a, a video on this channel and I was talking about, you know, there's a misunderstanding that the early church was very casual in the liturgy and that communion in the hand was the mode of reception in the early church. And there are many quotes in the Fathers, for example, St. Leo the Great says that we receive by the mouth, in Latin, ore, it's an ablative of instrumentation, this, this is the means by which you receive. St. Basil the Great says that communion in the hand is only allowed during times of persecution when there is no priest or deacon, or for the desert hermits who do not have access to the priests. Those are the only times that communion in the hand was allowed in the early church. And as you say, councils and synods condemn the practice, even with the pain, penalty of excommunication. One of the things that I've, I've got feedback on, and I'd like for you to comment on this, is they say, okay, well, clearly communion in the hand was normative in the early church. It was the preferred practice. But they say, but we don't need to kneel. We should stand. Even the Eastern churches stand. Can you speak to the importance of altar rails and receiving not only on the tongue, but on the knees? Well, there are several points now we have to distinguish. First, the kneeling. The kneeling is a common praxis of the Holy Scripture and even a very New Testamental praxis. Yes. Our Lord himself, God and man, gave us, gave us an example to kneel because he knelt in the uh, in Gethsemane when he was suffering his agony in the garden of Gethsemane. He was even prostrated on the, uh, on the ground and was kneeling evidently. And, and then the apostles, St. Stephen, the first martyr of the church, he died kneeling and this was written, he knelt, it is in the Acts of the Apostle. They sublime this moment that he was kneeling. It is moving. And then the, the apostle, St. Peter, was kneeling before he, he raised the, the dead. And then St. Paul was kneeling on the shore of Ephesus when he was saying farewell to the priests and bishops there, was kneeling, or everyone was kneeling, and, and so on. And then we, we see that St. Paul says, every knee should bend before the name of Jesus Christ. This is, it is the, 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 the first church, the Church of the Apostles. And then we know that from a testimony of the church history, it is really a, a document uh, transmitted by Eusebius of Caesarea, the great historian, that the first bishop of Jerusalem, uh, it was Saint Jacob, the minor, not the, the great, the, the, the elder. And so he was the, the, the so-called brother of the Lord. Yes. He was the first bishop and he was very venerated by even by the Jews because he was so observant of all the prescriptions and and Davis uh, they pointed out 
just on his knees, uh, the skin was so thick, like a, a camel. Uh, and so because he was continuously and always praying, kneeling on his knees. So it is the, the apostles and uh, James. And then there is a famous saying from a uh, desert father, from one of the sayings of the desert fathers of the first centuries. And this Cardinal Ratzinger mentioned in one of his books on, on liturgy, and uh, and when there was once the the devil appeared to a um, saint uh, hermit there desert father and he saw him in a in a human body but the the, the places there was no kneel knee, knees he saw the the devil with a body and legs, but without knees, mm -hmm. the knees, there were no knees. And then this, so why you have not knees? And the devil had to answer, because we do not kneel. The devil answered, we do not kneel. This is an old trans transmission of a desert father. And so on, there are plenty of examples that the kneeling was common in East and West. And even the Orthodox, the, the Eastern Rite, they are kneeling also during the liturgy. Uh, the, the faithful, they make the deep um, bowing. And so they kneel on their knees and then they bow with their head on the floor. So at least they have also the position. And sometimes in the in the Lent time, they are, they are kneeling also during the Lent prayers, for example. So it is a common, but uh, th this is the first, the importance of kneeling. The second, the communion rail. It's even the, the, the Eastern Church has more than communion rail, as we know. The iconostasis, it's a wall which separates the, the sanctuary from the nave, from the people, even it's it's common, you know, it's a wall with pictures in the doors and they are closing. And so, and the the Latin church uh, made these kind of communion rails or a kind of, um, they were called in the first centuries, we have the, the, the eldest testimony from the fourth century in the Latin church. They were called cancelli in Latin, so they were right. a kind of um, um, an item which it separates a barrier. visibly, a barrier, yes, yeah. which separates the nave from the sanctuary. And even Saint Augustine, you know Saint Augustine, he was very traditional, <laughs> and in the fourth century, there is an expression of him that people should prepare themselves worthily for the Holy Communion. And if one dares to come to Holy Communion, not prepared, not worthy, he will send him back from the Cancelli. So St. Augustine already mentioned this barrier uh, in Latin, the Cancelli, saying that uh, you are, you are uh, take care that you will not be dismissed and sent back to your place mm -hmm. from the place where communion is distributed and these are this barrier. And so since then, since the fourth century, it was always the, the church, the Latin church had this kind of, I would say, mini iconostasis with the communion rail of these barriers. Or in the Middle Ages, especially in Germany, there were some really stone walls separating a, a kind of iconostasis with wall, with a with stone built, with a door, and sometimes there was a, a crucifix and icons. Yes, and in, uh, in, uh, there in was northern in German Latin. In, in northern Europe, they have so, what we call uh, the uh, the wood screen, which is a wooden apparatus that's a barrier with the yes. with the crucifix on it 
Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so this is, uh, and then the, the, the other, we have to say that there are two, two um, liturgical um, traditions, the Eastern and the Western, and both are the richness of the church, both in their um, uh, characteristics, specific, proper characteristics, and we have not to mix them up. We have to keep. And so the Eastern form of veneration, it's a deep bowing or bowing until the earth. And we do not make this, we do this only very rarely on Holy Friday, for example, or on the ordinations, so, uh, the prostration. But the, the Eastern rites, they have continuously uh, these signs of prostration and so on. And this is their form of veneration. And our form, since we have not these, these frequent bowings and uh, prostratings as they have, we have more the simpler way, the kneeling down. But at least we have to keep this kneeling down. When we abolish the kneeling down, we have nothing. Right. At least we have to have something. And this is our proper Latin Roman tradition kneeling down. And we have to keep this as our proper expression of the adoration. And the Eastern Rite have the other's expression. And so uh, both are in a different mentality also. But we have to keep our Latin Roman tradition. You've called for this crusade of reparation to right the wrongs of Eucharistic abuse, but but also to console the heart of Jesus. Can you describe for the viewers what the theology of reparation is? Because I think from the 1960s, people have lost all sense of what reparation means towards God. Reparation, it is to repair what was broken, what was harmed. And this is reparation, the core, the essence of our redemption, of the redeeming work of Jesus Christ on the cross. His redeeming salvific sacrifice is a redemption. And therefore, he is called the Redemptor, the Redeemer. And so he, he again, he restored what was broken by the sin of Adam and our personal sins. And this is reparation. And only he is capable to make a, a sufficient a reparation, Jesus Christ. There is no other. Because he, in our body, he, he made this in our human nature offering himself, his body and blood, uh, as a sacrifice on the cross, a loving sacrifice. And so all the moments of physical pains and sufferings, and spiritual also, his suffering in Gethsemane and on the cross, and uh, moved by love uh, for the sinners, and moved by the love for the Father, this is what I would describe the meaning of reparation. But, and now comes the important thing, that God is so great and so uh, loving to us that he invites us to take part in his work of reparation. As we can read very clearly in the, in the epistle of St. Paul, to the Colossians 1.24. And this is the geological foundation of our reparation. And this, um, St. Paul says there, I rejoice in my sufferings, filling up, filling up what is lacking in Christ's sufferings for his body, the church. So it is a clear 
uh, ex um, explanation of what is reparation for us that we also are called to fill up with our sufferings what is still lacking in the efficiency for the body of Christ, for the members of body of Christ. His reparation has to be accepted by uh, the members of the body of Christ and by all people, by all men. And so this is the meaning of reparation, that God wants this, this is his will, that we take part and and take part and uh, do reparation uh, also for our own sins. So in every um, confession we receive a penance. This is a form of reparation for the, for the consequences of our sins. And the purgatory also is a kind of reparation or the consequences. Um, and so we have to repair to make reparation also for the sins of others, because we are connected in the mystical body of Christ. And uh, because Christ is touched with the sins of all human beings, of all men, as he expressed these into several saints, and as the magisterium of the church teaches us, especially in the encyclical of Pius the Eleventh. Miserentissimus Redemptor. It is the encyclical par excellence, I would say, for the theology of reparation. So there is the Pope explained all the aspects of the meaning of reparation there. So this is the church teaching of reparation. And our uh, duty also and then we have the example of a lot of saints who practiced this and who also wrote uh, some, uh, they, they left some works uh, on this, on this topic. I would mention as an example of, of reparation, of the mentality of reparation, maybe St. Francis of Assisi. Why? Because of his stigmas, he had the wounds of Jesus, the stigmas, and this is a participation in the suffering of Christ, really bodily. To my opinion, he is one of the first in our time, I mean, uh, from the Middle Ages, who gave this example. And then the other saints who suffered uh, vicariously, I mean, instead of the others. One famous saint, it's a Dutch saint from the 15th century, Saint Lidwina. Uh, she uh, suffered, she was terribly suffering, a young girl, until the end of her life, only suffering. And uniting, she was united in her sufferings with Christ in the intention of reparation of the sins of, of man. Then we have uh, some other saints who taught this, uh, uh, Saint John Judas, a French saint from the beginning of the 17th century. He wrote very deep and uh, profound explanations on the reparation. Then, of course, Saint Margaret Mary Alacoque, uh, her, her writings are extensively, she explains and mentions the theme of reparation, especially in, I would recommend to read her autobiography she wrote on, about her life and the, the Lord. This would be a helpful reading on this theme, St. Margaret Mary. Then, Another, uh, she is not canonized, but she is also important in the history of of spirituality. Is the Catherine de Bar? She was called Mother Mactilde of the Blessed Sacrament. In she lived in the 17th century in Paris, and she founded the Benedictine Sisters of the Perpetual Adoration. And so these, um, she also wrote uh, very deeply 
and extensively about the theme of reparation. Uh, the Silver Stream Priory in Ireland now published a new book about this Mother MacTilde of the Blessed Sacrament and her um, meditations on the Blessed Sacrament and the reparation. Don Mark, the prior, edited this, published, for example. And then we can mention as an example of our days of living the reparation spirituality, it was St. Padre Pio with his stigmas. He offered this and he experienced this as also a kind of reparation, Padre Pio. Not to forget a special uh, meaning in the reparation theology and has have the messages of Fatima, Our Lady of Fatima. So in the message of Fatima, the expiation or reparation, the, to atone the sins, it's a central uh, theme. And uh, Our Lady asked even the praxis of the first five Saturdays um, for the intention of the reparation. And then we have the very moving examples of the children of Fatima, St. Francisco Marto and Jacinta. They both gave an example of a moving life of reparation, by words, but more by their deeds. But I would also mention another case of the spirituality of reparation, which is the maybe not so known, but in some um, countries she is known. She was called the Little Nelly of Holy God of Cork in Ireland, a little girl of four years old. She was terribly sick. She had um, a kind of cancer of bones, all and tuberculosis of the bones. And she was in care of sisters. And this little Nelly of the Holy God, because she spoke of God always the Holy God, or the poor Holy God. She meant Jesus in the Eucharist. And she received Holy Communion in this age of four. And uh, after uh, the first Holy Communion, she was already very sick. She spent a couple of time absorbed in prayer, this little, little child after the Holy Communion. And so she died because of these pains and her sickness in this young age. But she always, when the sisters asked her, she said, I accept this for love of Holy God. It's a moving example of a child of four years to live real reparation, expiation, to, to joining the sufferings with Jesus and offering these sufferings to console Jesus. I hope there's this little... Nope, we lost His Excellency. Let's get him back. Just a moment. Get him right back here. We're, here he is. We are live streaming from Asia to America. Let's see if we can try him again. Hello. Here we are again. No worries. <laughs> we, have have, we have to have patience that's, today. That's right. Uh, someone, 
Someone is not happy with our conversation. No, I was thinking the same thing. I was thinking the same thing. But we, we will continue. We will continue. We will continue. Nevertheless. Um, you know, I, I have a daughter who's four years old, and she doesn't have those miraculous graces that little Nellie has, but I can already, talking to her, there's a, she already has an awe and a reverence for the Holy Eucharist, although she does not receive She's only ever been to the traditional Latin Mass, so she sees communion on the tongue, and she sees the consecration, and she sees the rails. And I think, you know, besides what we say at home, I think all of these things make an impression on her. And my my next daughter, who's seven, who's preparing for Holy Communion, she saw a video recently of communion in the hand, and she said to me, Daddy, that's wrong. So... Already these young children, when I think they see the traditional Roman rite and they attend the Latin Mass, it's infused into them by just being there. The liturgy and the praxis is a catechism for the little, the little minds, the little hearts. Yes, it is very beautiful, the example of your daughter, but it is again the confirmation as our Lord said, from the mouth of the children, the wisdom of God speaks. Because the children are innocent yes. and pure. And in a pure soul, the wisdom of God is more evident. And so uh, this is, of course, uh, a, a good demonstration mm -hmm. of the fact that we have to receive our Lord kneeling in on the tongue. Yes. She, she even said, she said, Daddy, they need the pat. She meant the patent, but she called it the yes. pat. They need the pat because it might fall down. So she already, is. she doesn't even know the words. She calls it the yes. pat. But already she understands that protection needs to be made for the Eucharist. And I think to myself, here's a seven-year-old girl who gets that, who I never explained this to her, and she already understands this. And yet we have priests and laymen who don't seem to want to use a communion patent or use a rail. It's just, it's frustrating. Yes. This is a demonstration that the adults who have no sensibility of these signs, uh, there is a lacking of faith in them, it's an evident, and um, a kind of non-Catholic understanding of the importance of the exterior signs of reverence. Yes. It's a kind of Protestant, uh, implicit Protestant mentality that we do not need signs. And it's against the entire economy of our salvation. The signs are important. Even the details are important. And so the children are teaching us. And our Lord said, if you will not become like children, you will not enter in the kingdom of God. But I tell you another example also. Once I was in Italy, and uh, a, a parish priest invited me to speak to the children of the who were preparing for the first Holy Communion. They were maybe eight year old, uh, nine. So, and I was was speaking. I was speaking about Jesus in the Eucharist. That He is our Lord. He is our God in this holy, holy host this little host, and then when I finished, I asked the children, oh children, uh, what, you, what you're saying, why we have to kneel down when we receive Jesus in the Eucharist? And then spontaneously, a little boy shouted out in Italian, perché è Gesù? Because it is Jesus. Yes. And this little boy answered, because it is Jesus, and no more. Yes. It was so evident for this child. It is Jesus. And for these little children, I explained this, and they were all understanding this. But for some bishops and priests, we have to explain one, two, three hours, <laughs> and they will not understand, because there is a lack of faith, yes. a lack of love, ultimately, to Jesus. Yes. Like, also, 
uh, it's striking me the episode in the gospel when Jesus was invited by the Pharisee Simon to a supper. And then came uh, the, the woman, the sinner, and the woman started to, to weep and, and uh, with the tears to wash the, 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 the feet of the Lord and then to anoint his feet with the oil, with the, with the anointment. And then this Pharisee, he was upset. Why you allow to be touched by this sinner? She's, and then what our Lord said to him, he, repro he made reproaches to Simon, said, why you did not give me to wash my hands, to wash something? Why you did not embrace me and kiss me when I came to you? So it is little signs. And Simon did not give a kiss to our Lord. He, he did not wash his feet. Mm -hmm. And our Lord expected this from him. Yeah. And so I think the Lord will today, when these bishops and priests will come to the judgment of God, to Christ, the judge, he will say to them, why you have not observed this respect and reverence with my body and these little children and these little ones in the church, they did this like the, the woman, the sinner. Yes. From the mouths of babes. We've seen the, um, these changes, of course, happen after the Second Vatican Council and with the Novus Ordo Mise. Now, some people are going back and rereading Sacrosanctum Concilium, which is the guiding document on the reform of the liturgy. There seems to be some ambiguity in this document. Do you think that parts of Sacrosanctum Concilium should be criticized or should be questioned? Um, what, what should we understand happened in the 1960s from 63 to 69 with regard to the liturgy and the changes? Well, I think that first we have to look what is good. And there is, I think, the first part of Sacrosanctum Concilium, where are the general norms about liturgy, they are real good. And we can use them, really. For example, in the beginning, number two, it's a beautiful description, what is liturgy, what is the church, where it's stressed that what is human, what is visible, what is temporal, has to be oriented and sub, uh, submitted uh, to what is divine, what is heavenly, what is eternal. It's a beautiful, and this is also uh, to apply to the liturgy. And therefore, from this principle in number two, the Novus Ordo, and the at, the at Populum celebrations. It's a plain contradiction to number two of Sacrosanctum Concilium. And then in number eight, it's saying that our uh, earthly liturgy has to, is a participation in the heavenly liturgy of the angels. So this uh, characteristic has to be. And then uh, uh, in number 23, says that in liturgy there should not be innovations <laughs> unless, unless, and then came the famous uh, comma, unless there are, um, but even so, they said, unless there is a, a real necessity, need of the church, and unless it, there is a organic uh, improvement, these forms already existed. Well, it is a good principle, but it's not so clear as, as usually in the Vatican Council documents. They express good truth, but in one sentence after, right. they in some way relativize this. Uh, 
This is the problem. But in general, the, the, the first part is good, I think, and also the stress of Latin, that Latin must be uh, kept, maintained in the liturgy, and uh, even mandated that the, the people should know to sing the ordinarium. So it is a mandate of the council. And then the the, the Gregorian chant is the has to have to be the priority in the church. It's also good. So we have a good statements there, but unfortunately the other part of the practical points, it's to my opinion not so good, because when you read to every sacrament, they say the books has to be reviewed. This sacrament, the rites has to be have to be reviewed, and so one has the impression that we arrived in sixty three, and now we make a completely new liturgy. All has to be renewed. What the church kept thousand years, yeah. uh, the uh, the very expression continuously has to be reviewed, reviewed the rites. It's an impression that it was bad before now. And so it was a kind of implicit condemnation of the rites which the church celebrated centuries and even millennium before, yes. continuously. And this is dangerous and this is revolutionary. Mm -hmm. Even so, it was in a general way, have have to be reviewed. Of course, this is a very relative phrase. You can review and change maybe one word. It's also reviewed. Right. But you can change completely the right and the meaning uh, and the structure of the right. And this happened in so many sacraments when you compare. It is a general, a general weak, weakening of the clarity of the theology of the sacraments, of the specific sacraments. It is a more anthropocentric element in the uh, new rites of the other sacraments. And it's a lack of sacrality also, and a lack of the mystery, the, the, the moments of it's a mystery. And it's, it's as, uh, I would say, a slight tendency to Pelagi Pelagianism. Uh, that we have to do something, we have to instruct people, we have to do something, but the sacraments are the works of Christ in the, in the first place. Yeah. And he is working through the, of course we have to prepare people, but before the council, the people were prepared for sacraments, the adults, I mean. They had a good catechesis of preparation. And even the children were better prepared theologically, catechetically, than after the council. Yes. And so, they, they, had, they had the knowledge, in some way, what is the sacrament. Right. And the rest is the mysterious rites, where it's an expression, and now it's God working. And when God is working, we cannot uh, analyze this, like uh, mathematics or geometry, or make a, a, dis, a conference only, like a Protestant preaching and gathering. So this is my internal impression. But I repeat, we should not, uh, um, how do you say, in, invalidate Sacrosanctum Concilium, but take those expressions which are good. And with this, we can also at least correct the abuses which are now in the church, in the official, I mean, uh, reform of liturgy. I don't speak about the evident abuses. I speak now of the official liturgical reforms, which have 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 to be again changed, at least to come closer to the principles of Sacrosanctum Concilium. There's there's a growing awareness, Your Excellency, uh, you know, not just amongst traditionalists, but I think currently lay Catholics and also priests are growing more and more aware that our current crisis 
does relate to what we might call problem passages in the documents of the Second Vatican Council. And I'm thinking about, you know, liturgical things, like you mentioned in the review, uh, syncretism, false ecumenism, um, you know, things like uh, that Muslims adore the same God with us, uh, that Buddhists can attain perfect detachment in this life, Hindus contemplate the, the divine, uh, all these kinds of things. And these are problem passages. And so can you, can you speak to the concern that we Catholics as laymen, as bishops, can have a discussion or perhaps even criticism over these passages of the council, but we that doesn't make us schismatics and it doesn't put us outside the church. Can you make a comment on that or explain how this is possible? Yes, I think first we have to be very honest, intellectually honest, and to take the evidence I think that even good Catholics, the, the conservative Catholics, so a lot, they made in the past 50 years a um, forced interpretation. They would call this the squaring of the circle mm -hmm. or mental acrobatics right. uh, to uh, that to harmonize, which is evidently not possible to harmonize. Of course, the majority of the texts are good of the Vatican Council, and some are ambiguous, and the ambiguous one we can interpret with the tradition of the Church in a benevolent way. It is, this said also Archbishop Lefebvre, for example. But there are some expressions, uh, not so much, but there are, and they are, they are important, and they have very, um, uh, bad consequences. It's the themes you mentioned, for example. And the greatest problem with the texts, those, those texts who are problematic, they touch, to my opinion, we can, uh, um, they are reduced to one topic, relativism. Mm. Doctrinal relativism, and specifically it's a relativism uh, in the last consequences. It is a relativism about our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. Relativization of the gospel, relativization of, the, of Jesus Christ, his incarnation and the redeeming work and the church of the Catholic faith, the only one. This is the, all these expressions which you mentioned, they ultimately, they have their roots in relativism, in relativizing our Lord Jesus Christ, and this is the, the greatest sin for me, relativizing our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a kind of betrayal. And so, for example, if you say a dead as Lumen Gentium 16 says, we Catholics and the Muslims, they adore with us, nobiscum in Latin, with us, and even adore God. Uh, and this is, uh, this is wrong. Uh, it could be interpreted in some way, but even I think this phrase, it's per se wrong, cannot be interpreted. Why? Because we have to to look on the on the words on the terms. Otherwise, we will not be honest. When you speak about adoration, when you use the word nobiscum together, mm -hmm. so it is an act of a religion, an act of adoration yes. of us Catholics. We have to come and the same act of adoration. It's wrong. Uh, of course, we could say that we adore one true God. The Muslims, they also adore uh, the one God which exists. This we could say, but the, the difference is now here. 
And the error of Lumen Gentium 16 is the following. That there is no, there is, um, how do you say, rel relativized, put on the same level, our supernatural act of adoration as, as uh, the adopted children of God yeah. in the truth, in Christ, and in the Spirit, Holy Ghost. This act is put on the same level as the natural, let us say, of good Muslims who are maybe believing in innocently in the one good in the one God, but they adore God always on a natural level, the Muslim, not on a supernatural level. And so this is a, a substantial difference in the act of adoration. Therefore, you can never say, it's wrong in say, we Catholics, the children of God, who adore the act of adoration together with the Muslims, this is wrong. Yeah. We can say, we adore always in a supernatural way, God as the Trinity, in, true, in spirit, Holy Ghost, and in truth, in Christ. Whereas, the Muslims, they adore the one God only on a natural level, according to the capacity, the ability of every human being of the natural knowledge of the existence of God. It's a dogma of faith, the First Vatican Council. And according to the natural knowledge of God, I can adore God, uh, consequently, on a natural level, the true God which I can recognize with the light, uh, with the natural light of my reason. And this is the case in, I would say, in good Muslims who really believe in God and who, who don't enter, who do not enter this Quran theology. But this is for me, for example, a relativization of, of, of course, already of the act of adoration and of our sonship filial and with the Muslims. And then, and then the, for me, the, uh, the other very dangerous is the dignitatis humane on the religious freedom, because they are put in one phrase, two truth. One, it's the perpetual constant teaching of the church that uh, human being has religious freedom, uh, uh, um, in the sense of that nobody can be forced to believe in God. It was always taught by the apostles and by our Lord Jesus Christ in the church. Religious freedom has every person in the sense that no one can be forced to believe. It's okay. But then comes the comma and the, the, the the second part of the phrase is contradicting because it says, and in the same way, the same way, religious freedom is also for every human being, every person, to not be impeded, not be hindered, to choose to practice and to spread individually and even uh, collectively the religion according to the choice or the conviction of his conscience. And then the next phrase says, and this right of freedom, religious freedom. So there are two, 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 right. two rights. The, the traditional always taught the church and the other, which is wrong, it's not a right to, to perform, uh, uh, for example, ad idolatry, right. that both rights are founded, had, have their foundation in human nature. But when something is a right of the human nature, it is positively willed by God. Right. So this is referring only to the first part of the phrase, it's okay, yes, but not to the second part, because if you say 
that it is the you it is a right of your nature and so with other words it is the same as you say it is god positively willed by god it is positively willed by god that no one should be uh, hindered uh, to practice and to spread let us say Uh-oh. We may have lost you, Your Excellency. Positively. God, ad- we lost God, you for just God a moment there. Do you hear me? Permitting this, yes. Yes, I hear you. You said, what, right when you were saying, uh, it, would it be a right, for instance, to say, and then we lost you there? So it is not a right, uh, for instance, for human nature, and therefore it's not built by God positively, that every person can uh, choose and spread, for example, idolatry, a religious of idolatry, because there are so many people who are saying, I am convinced in my conscience I have took to practice idolatry. So this is against divine, aid, divine revelation. Right. And so this phrase of the Second Vatican Council, which can be um, expressed in another way, but in the same. It is substantially the same as the phrase, the famous phrase in the Abu Dhabi document, yes. which says that the plurality or diversity of religions and the diversity of the human sexes and the nations, people, is the wise will of God as God created man, corresponds to the will of God. And so, but when you are honestly, this is in another way the same expressed as dignitatis humanae, the second part of the phrase, that no one, that this is a human right, uh, that uh, and based in your human nature, and so hence willed by God positively, that you can choose and spread collectively, let us say, adultery, no, or, or uh, I mean, idolatry, and other bad uh, false religions. So we have to be very sincere and intellectually honest. This is in, non-acceptable. And from these two phrases, Lumen Gentium 16, Dignitatis Humanae 2, this is the root from which stemmed and developed all the um, relativism, which we uh, experienced and stated in the last five decades in the life of the church. And the summit was the, the Assisi meeting, the religious meeting in uh, 1806, which John Paul II convoked. Yes. And then the, the peak was, of course, last October, the veneration of the Pachamama idol in Vatican, in the Basilica of St. Peter. So, but you see, if it is the will of God, the positive will of God, that a group of the Amazonian Indians, pagans, I mean, who who venerate Pachamama, the idol, be not be hindered to spread their cult, so the Pope says, I cannot hinder them because it is a right of human nature. And, and when it is a right of human nature, it is the positive will of God. And when God positively wills that the, the Amazonian Indians uh, do the act of veneration of their idol Pachamama, I cannot prohibit them because this is their right which God gave them. And so I can admit them even to St. Peter. It would be for me the last consequence, the last of the consequences based also on Dignitatis Humanae, this specific phrase, and Abu Dhabi document. Of course, those who defend Dignitatis Humanae, they say, but in the same document, the Church says that Um, the Vatican Council 
uh, continues to teach the traditional uh, teaching of the church uh, regarding the moral duty of every human being to seek uh, the true religion, which is the Catholic Church. This is true, and thanks be to God. Mm-hmm. But in the next number, paragraph, what is, is correctly said, traditional, is undermined. Right. And this is the entire problem with this conte- in this context. And the same that you mentioned with the Buddhists and the, the Hinduists, when they can reach the superior illumination by their own, uh, by their own uh, power, Yes. And the, the, the complete freedom and detachment, this is a, a heresy. You cannot, by your own, without yeah. Christ, without the, the, the grace of Christ, to, to reach the illumination and detachment and the freedom. It's impossible. It's Pelagian. It's Pelagian. It's, it is Pelagian. And also relativism, yes. that Christ is not the only source. Right. And so, you see, these texts cannot be accepted as they are, I would say, the expressions. And therefore, I think that one day the Church should formally correct uh, Lumen Gentium 16, the expression, specific expression, not the entire document, but, but this specific expression, and in Nostra Aetate, and also in the ecumenical decree on the non-Christians, that that the Holy Ghost is using them as instruments. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are not the sectarians and the heretics are not instruments as such. The communities of the Holy Ghost of divine providence, yeah. and they had to be corrected because you see, it's conducting us to relativism, mm-hmm. and so you can be. Catholic, you can be also Protestant because it's, it's the Holy Ghost using you as Protestant as, a, as an instrument. You can also be a Muslim because you are drawn together with us, the true God. Yes. And you can, and so on. And this is a relativization of the, this is for me the deepest problem of Vatican II, the relativization of Jesus Christ and the gospel. Yes. Related to that topic, Pope Francis has removed the title Vicar of Christ from the official list of titles. What's your reaction to this? Yeah, of course, it is very sad that he did this because this is for me one of the most beautiful titles which a successor of St. Peter has, Vicar of Christ, and most deeply theologically also for me because uh, Peter and the popes are only vicars. They are representing not themselves, mm. not the College of Cardinals, not the bishops. They are representing Christ, the good shepherd of the church and the head of the church. And so they are a kind of visible sign, sign only. In, in some way as a sacramental sign, not a sacramental sign, but a sign which indicates to a superior reality. And therefore, the, uh, this is most apt expressed in Vicar of Christ. Mm-hmm. He's not Vicar of God. This, is good. this would be wrong, but Vicar of Christ. And it seems that the abolishment of this the abolition of this title, it's increasing a wrong understanding of the papacy that he is doing, uh, he's considering the papacy and the church as something which is his property or his ownership or like a more uh, an institution of man and not that he is in every in every every act and word, he has to be very careful and be uh, conscious that he is uh, representing Christ, the vicar of Christ. I think should be kept the title, and I am convinced this will return. Uh, in some way, some popes behave themselves 
when they changed so drastically the inheritance, the treasures of the church, um, either the doctrine or the liturgy during the past 2,000 years, they behaved themselves not so much as vicars of Christ, but as successors of Christ. Hmm. Hmm. I am the successor of Christ. Now I am have I can do what I want mm -hmm. because I have the plen plenitude of powers. Mm -hmm. Yes, the Pope has the plenitude of powers, but only vicarious. And there is uh, the, the preface of the Mass of the Apostles. There is a beautiful expression about the apostles. And there is the title the church gives in the preface of the apostles, a beautiful title of the apostles. They called, the church calls the apostles pastores vicarii, vicarious pastors, mm -hmm. vicarious shepherds. Mm -hmm. And so let us imagine if, uh, if already the apostles are only vicarious, vicars, Shepherds, vicars of Christ, the apostles themselves. Mm. Uh, how more? How much more has every pope who is not an apostle but a successor of St. Peter only has to be humble and be happy to be a vicarious shepherd vicar, even the supreme shepherd vicar. This would be the most apt for me uh, meaning of the ministry of the Pope. Yes, couldn't agree more. Well said. One one final question, and that is the last five years, seven years. You know, the pontificate of of Pope Francis. There's been a lot of flashpoints or events. Amoris Laetitia, Abu Dhabi document, the Pachamama idols. Uh, what do you think is the most significant or dangerous event or document that's happened in the last five or so years? I think that the most dangerous document was the document of Abu Dhabi, mm -hmm. which the Pope signed, even so it is not a document of the magisterium, but it is now implemented and handled and treated as it would be a document of the magisterium of the Pope, even so he signed this only. But it gave this document so a high moral authority in the Church. It is for me the, uh, the worst document which existed in the Church history, maybe after the Arians' documents or against the divinity of the Son. It is the second maybe in some way worse because it is putting Christ on the same level yes. uh, ultimately with Mohammed, with Buddha and the others because if God positively wills the plurality of religions so they are all equal willed of God yes. accepted by God and then Christ is no more Christ Christ is one of the religions, yeah. and this is the most dangerous, and this is in some way uh, a direct blow to the gospel, to the entire gospel, and to the entire meaning of the church, that we are only to proclaim that the entire humanity, to lead them to Christ, the only Savior. This is the only meaning of the church. Right. And so, and the, uh, the second point of your, which was the event, the most um, tragic event, it's of, to my opinion, without doubt, the Pachamama veneration in the Basilica of Rome, in the Vatican Gardens, and in the churches close to the Vatican. This was an, was an abomination, never happened. It was the last time time happened the adoration of the golden calf. The last time 
it was made in the golden calf, idolatry acts. And now we are witnessing again uh, uh, abomination from the Old Testament occurred again in, in the heart of the church. This is for me one of the greatest attacks of Satan, which he managed, but he will not win. He will not conquer. He is now, he, the Satan, and those, the enemies of the church, are now very happy and they are, that they managed to, to make this mortal attack to the Catholic Church and to the Gospel through Abu Dhabi document and through the Papa Pachamama adoration. But they are wrong because they don't believe that the church is divine. Yeah. And Christ will demonstrate them and to us that this is his church, yes. his bride, even though his bride is now in some way um, uh, tied the hands of her and she is uh, denigrated, she is humbled. The Our Mother Church yes. by the own shepherds from inside, yeah. insulting Our Mother Church with all these relativizing documents starting already not in not so uh, clear extent in some expressions of, of Vatican II, then a CC meeting, it's, it's a logical consequence to Abu Dhabi and to the Pachamama. And so, uh, I mean, this is clear that our Lord will win this and is winning and he, he already conquered all this. And we have to believe again in the indestructibility of our church and in these um, times of trials, we have to, uh, to help our mother church. Then when we remain faithful in the faith, in the sacraments, with our reparation, with our fidelity, even so we are sinners, but with the help of the grace of God, even the sinners can remain faithful as we are. And with our works, with the grace of God, we will contribute again to the to the renewal of our mother church, that our mother church will again be led from her exile, again, to be more radiant in her beauty, the bride of Christ. But she is already radiant in the souls of the innocent, of the pure children, of the families, Catholic families, of the good priests, and the good bishops. And so we have to be very, um, how do you say, we have to be very firm and in our convictions and also to be quiet and to be um, confident, confident always in the, in the uh, victory of Christ. And so we will continue with the grace of God, now with this crusade to be uh, adorers, lovers, defenders, and consolers of our Lord Jesus Christ. And with these acts, slowly, slowly, God will renew the church. Wonderful and beautiful and well said. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. And before I ask for you to to perhaps close us with an Ave Maria and a blessing, we would love that. Um, I'm going to link the um, the uh, the prayer that's uh, over at Remnant and also your your website, and encourage everyone. We have all, if you are a Catholic and you've been Catholic for more than a year, you have likely seen disrespect or perhaps even a desecration or disrespect to the Eucharist. We all, even though we aren't the ones that perform a desecration, 
we all need to make reparation and console the sacred heart. And His Excellency is calling us globally, all over the world, to do this. And I think this is a means by which the church, as you just said, Your Excellency, will be renewed. It will move the sacred heart to rescue us and to reform the church and to give us holy priests and bishops and religious and lay people and families so that once again the Catholic Church grows strong and can evangelize all the peoples of the earth. So, Your Excellency, I'd, I'd love for a blessing. If there's anything you want to add at the end, I will make sure to, to link the prayer of reparation that you have written. It's a beautiful prayer so that people can, can print that out and have it and pray it in their homes or in their churches. And uh, I'll also link the article to this crusade of reparation. Is there anything you'd like to add before we close? I would, I would only thank you for your witness. And also, I would thank to all who are already uh, participating in the crusade and who will still participate. And I think there's this world crusade, I would call them the powerful army of the little ones. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage you to continue. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tui mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostre. Amen. Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto, sicut erat in principio et nunc et semper et in secula seculorum. Amen. Amen. Dominus vobiscum, et cum spiritu tuo, et benedictio Dei Omnipotentis Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti, descendet super vos, et mane et semper. Amen. Amen. Your Excellency, thank you so much. Uh, it's such an honor and a blessing to be able to speak with you, and on behalf of so many lay Catholics everywhere, thank you for being such a holy and concerned bishop and shepherd of souls. We we see it on your face, we hear it in your voice, and we we read it in your your writings and in your actions. So thank you so much for your witness. It does inspire us, and may God richly bless you and reward you. Goodbye. God bless you. All right. Thanks, everybody, for, for watching. Please like and subscribe, and we'll see you in the videos to come. Till then, God bless and Godspeed.